Also on Sunday mornings, we're going through this amazing epistle of Romans, and today find ourselves in verse 15 of Romans 7. So I'll have you turn there at this time in your Bibles, and if you're able, I'll have you stand. You can follow along with me. If you're unable to stand, that's all right. But you can follow along with me as I read the text, and the text will be Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 19. The Apostle Paul is writing by the Holy Spirit and says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, verse 17, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Did you get that? Good. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, it's passages like this that bring us to that place where we have to acknowledge that unless you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive, then our time in your word today will have been in vain. So Lord, we're going to ask you for the Holy Spirit to speak now and to teach us now and to minister to us now. So Lord, will you? We're asking you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Today's teaching is going to be part one of a new series I've titled, When the Going Gets Tough. Now, I know that you've already finished that because you've heard it said that when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? Wrong. That's not what we're, <laughs> that's not what we're going to talk about today. By way of introduction, I want to begin by asking two questions, the first of which is this. Have you ever wondered why one minute you can be worshiping and praising God, then the next minute you find yourself totally in the flesh? No? Me neither. Let's close in prayer. We'll just go eat and... <laughs> Second question. Have you ever wondered why the spiritual struggle back and forth is so difficult and why it seems that it gets worse the more you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Listen, if your answer to both questions is yes, then you're in really good company. And not only are you in good company, it's a good sign. Let me explain. The very fact that you're struggling is evidence that the Spirit is working. Let me say this. The spiritual struggle will intensify the more you and I grow and mature in our Christian faith. Thanks a lot, Pastor. I really appreciate that. Aren't you supposed to, you know, preach a sermon that tells us, you know, that everything is going to go well in our lives? No, that's the other church that you could have went to this morning. To me, this explains why it is that some professing Christians just live for themselves and live for the pleasures that this world has to offer, and there's no problem. There's no struggle. They don't wrestle with it. They have no problem with the things that have taken up residence in their so-called Christian lives. Why is that? Well, 
perhaps it's that at some point they just caved in. They just acquiesced to the devil, the flesh, and the world, and thus no struggle could ensue. They just gave up the struggle, gave up the fight. I like how one writer so aptly said it. The struggle is a sign of spiritual life. Before I was converted, my pathetic attempt to turn over a new leaf cost little and lasted less. As the Spirit gives me strength to struggle, it hurts much more. Two spies are captured. The one who resists torture suffers far more than the one who tells all at the first turn of the screw. How true. You know, if the truth be known, those of us who share the gospel with others and maybe have the privilege of leading others to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we could be the ones that are actually at fault. Why do I say that? Well, we have good intentions, but though well-intentioned, we're all prone to set people up for this epic failure. How so? Well, we paint the canvas of the Christian life with the soft brush of an easy life. Come to Christ and all your problems will go away. Oh, it, it's, oh, happy day. <laughs> but it's not because all my problems will go away. Listen, I think I speak on behalf of everyone here in this wonderful church this morning, but uh, when I came to Christ, oh, my good, the problems had only just begun. <laughs> <laughs> See, what happens is when we communicate the gospel in that way, that all your problems will go away, then you set people up and now they're expecting smooth sailing. When the fact of the matter is, Smooth sailing, I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. It's the opposite that's the truth. The Christian life is riddled with battles. It's been said that the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. I say this in love, the truth in love, because I love. And as a pastor, I really have permission not to do anything, but I just want to say to you that if you're playing church or you're playing Christianity, you need to understand that Christianity, the Christian life, is paved, the road is paved with hardship. And it's replete throughout the pages of Scripture. We read in Acts where we're told that there, it's through much tribulation, much hardship, many trials that we enter into the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes I think the reason for that is because it has this way of wa making us want to leave. In high school, I was a teacher's kid. My dad was my teacher. That was, explains a lot. I'm still scarred for life. But... Um, my teachers would always, you know, point the finger at me and, you know, pull me in the principal's office. I had reserved seating in the principal's office. I had a pew dedicated with my name on it. That was my seat in the principal's office because I spent most of my time there. And the principal would always say to me, you're a teacher's kid and you should do better and shame on you. And, blah, 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 you know. And that just made me want to, you know, rebel even more. By the way, don't look at me like that. I wasn't a Christian yet. I didn't come to Christ till age 19 after I graduated. <laughs> I barely graduated because, you know, basically what happened was I, I made it a point to, uh, you know, never uh, get on the honor roll. Actually, it accidentally happened one time. I accidentally got on the honor roll, and I made sure that it never happened again. Now, why do I share that? 
Well, it was really interesting because one of the teachers in the school, I think, felt so sorry for me and took pity on me and had a talk with me and said to me, not a Christian, I, I had no idea how profound this would be later in life after I came to Christ. She said, you know, how some, you know, graduates never really get past their high school days. You know, they're the ones that, you know, these are the glory days. And it doesn't help when a teacher in the classroom says something to their students that goes like this. This is the, these are the best days of your life. I'm thinking, this is as good as it gets? <laughs> school, my high school, I, I, I hate this. And you're telling me that this is the best that it's ever going to get? Shoot me now. But some people, when they graduate, they don't really graduate. And they're always living in the high school days because those were the glory days. She said, but you, <laughs> you want to graduate and you want to leave high school behind and press on, don't you? I said, ma'am, you have no idea <laughs> how bad I want to get out of here. And it hit me. That's the way it is in this world. The harder it is here, the more we want to get out of here. Now, wouldn't you agree that the Christians you have the hardest time talking about the rapture with are those who have things are going really well? It's kind of like, Lord, come soon. It's not come quickly because, oh, hey, things are going. But boy, let adversity strike. Oh, Lord, come quickly. True? Some of you are going through a trial. You want the Lord to come back yesterday. You want him to come back quickly, but things are going well down here, not so much. You know, we're seeing this on Thursday nights in our study of the book of Joshua. And we see it with the Israelites in the possessing of the promised land. And what lies ahead are battles ahead. And they're not going to possess the land before they enter into the battles for the land. Possessing the promises of God, the victorious Christian life, never precedes the battles in life. And here's another thing. Just because God has promised it to us doesn't mean it's not going to be a battle for us. The Christian life is hard. And that's the truth. The problem is, we develop this faulty mindset. We think, oh, you know, it's easy. I can take it easy. I can just glide and abide. What a rude awakening you're in for. Because the reality is, the Christian experience is full of hardship. I'm of the belief that we need look no further for the reasons so many people fall away and backslide. Or maybe they were never truly born again to begin with. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter. Beginning in, the verse, uh, in verse 3, the 13th chapter of Matthew, Jesus is going to teach a famous parable now. We call it the parable of the sower. We read, then he, speaking of Jesus, told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed, verse 7, fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. 
This parable has the explanation of what it means, and it's found in verse 18 of the same chapter. Jesus says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. In this parable, Jesus is teaching us that unless the seed of God's word is met with the supple soil of our minds and hearts, there will be no fruit. And by their fruit, you shall know them. A papaya does not grow on a mango tree. You'll know it's not a mango tree if it's got papaya. It's a papaya tree. You'll know by the fruit. I know that's deeply profound. I'll give you some time on that one. We'll get back to you. Now, while we're given the different reasons all the others did not grow and produce a crop, there does seem to be some similarities with the three. One hears it, but doesn't understand it. Another is shallow with no root, and the other is worried about, deceived by, and choked with life's riches. There's a common denominator. I would suggest that they all have that same faulty mindset. I come to Christ, it's a playground, not a battleground. But then the battles come. Wait a minute, you never told me about this. What do you mean I have to pick up my cross and die to myself? You told me on TV that I could, you know, have my best self. He didn't say anything about dying to self. It's a bait and switch. You tricked me. My life has never been so difficult. It's never been so hard. Now, all of a sudden, I can't enjoy sin anymore because the Holy Spirit is right there going, Hey! That's sin, and I'm extremely uncomfortable. That's good. And I struggle. That's great. Before coming to Christ, you didn't have a struggle. I love it when I talk to new believers. There's such a freshness and such an innocence and even a naivete. Man, I'm really struggling. I, I just, I, I, I got lust in my heart. I just look at it and I go, praise God. What, pastor? Did you just say praise God? Yes. Before you were a Christian, you'd have never thought twice about the lust in your heart. Now the Holy Spirit is going, hey, that's lust. Before it was appreciating the beauty. That's a big difference uh, before, <laughs> before coming to Christ. You see what I'm saying? It's sin now. Now you're struggling with sin. And the very thing you want to do, you don't do, you can't do, you hate to do, but you still do it. I'm struggling with this, God. It's a battle, great. The problem is, if you weren't told that and didn't know that before, you're blindsided. See, the trampled down don't understand. The shallow with no root deep down don't last. The rich choked with worries go down, and none of the above ever produce. They've all become disillusioned, disenchanted, disgruntled, disappointed with God, 
God didn't pull through and follow through and make good on his end of the deal. When they all become disillusioned, it's because when the trampling by the wayside, the heat of the day, and the troubles of life come on and in their Christian life, they can't believe it. They don't know what to do about it. They weren't anticipating it. I didn't think that the Christian life was going to be this hard. I think this is one of the main reasons we have so much detail that's recorded about the Israelites in the Old Testament. God is preparing them for the battles that are being prepared for them. I tell you, I love the Old Testament. And if it seems like I'm continuing to shamelessly plug our Thursday night Bible study here at 7 o'clock in the sanctuary, Thursday night right here, it's because I'm shamelessly plugging our midweek Thursday night Bible study in the Old Testament. It's been said that the Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. You know, when I first came to Christ, I, I was a blank slate. I had no idea. You know, I, I, I came to Christ, and I all of a sudden now desired to read the Bible. The problem is I didn't have a Bible, so I went out and I bought a Bible, and I bought the Good News Bible because that was the extent of my ability. That was the extent of my vocabulary. That's all I could ever understand. I was so limited, and my brain cells were so destroyed from all the drugs and drinking and lifestyle that I was living. That was the only thing I could understand, and even that was a stretch. <laughs> you know, God has done an amazing work, re restoring unto me that which the locusts have eaten. But I, I couldn't put it down. I'm reading, in fact, it, six months. The first time I read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it only took me six months. I couldn't put it down. But here's the thing. I started in the Old Testament. And I'm a blank slate, and I start in Genesis, okay, cool. I get to Exodus, cool. But then I start getting into Leviticus and Numbers and do no wrong to me. I mean, Deuteronomy and what's all this animal sacrifice? And the, I have, you mean I have to go get a lamb and slay it and sprinkle the blood every time I sin? That's a lot of sheep. I was a, I had no idea, because I started in the Old Testament, and I, I think, do they do that in churches, because I didn't even go to a church yet, I had read the Bible first, by the way, great thing, read the Bible first, <laughs> then, you, then I was invited to Calvary Chapel at the time, and this is, I won't tell you how long ago, because then you'll figure out how old I am, so it was a long time ago, and, uh, but I, I stepped foot in that church, and it dawned on me, wait a minute, I don't have to kill and sacrifice innocent animals for my sin because Jesus Christ was the once and for all sacrifice for my sin. Oh my, the light bulbs went off. I just, praise God. Everybody's looking at me going, you freak. What is the matter with you? I'm worshiping, I'm praising God. Thank you, the lamb that was slain. Now, why do I share that? I have no idea. It's uh, <laughs> no idea, actually. There's a point. <laughs> Had I not understood the Old Testament, I would have never appreciated the New Testament. If I don't appreciate the difficulty of Romans 7, I'll never appreciate the victory of Romans 8. If you really stop and think about it, we don't want it any other way. If it's not hard, it's not worth it. Let me take a step further. The harder it is, the more valuable it becomes. But we have a problem like the Israelites. We're wired in our sin nature to devalue that which comes too easy. Why is that? Because the end product is cheapened by virtue of how the process is weakened. 
We don't like the process. I don't want the wilderness, I want the promised land. Can we bypass the wilderness and the roughness and the ruggedness and the harshness of it? No. If you somehow try to rush through that in the end, you'll cheapen that which God desires to do in your life. The harder it is, the more valuable it is. But see, we don't make that distinction between price and value. See, sometimes we think the cheapest price is the best value. And that's not true. And I'm finding that out in my own life. In fact, you can pray for me about this. I'm, I'm having a struggle over sunglasses. I, yeah, I know it's a very spiritual problem and struggle, but I, I just can't bring myself to, you know, apply for financing and pay a jillion dollars for these sunglasses. You know, those really expensive. And, you know, cause in my way of thinking, I, I, I'm paying for the name on those glasses, right? I mean, can we be on? Who is Tommy Hilfiger anyway? <laughs> I had somebody at the first service say, it's the brother of Johnny Go Figure. That, oh, that's, oh, that helps clear it up. I'm paying for the name. And so what I do is I go out and I spend $5 on cheap sunglasses at Walmart. Because I figure, you know, one of the things that's going to happen is it's going to get broken, it's going to get sat on, it's going to get stolen, it's going to get lost. Now that we have a dog, it's going to get chewed up to the smithereens. That'll probably happen first. Anyway. Uh, so why spend all that money on these sunglasses and, oh, but they're such good quality. Well, I can't justify the cost-value relationship. So here's my math. You ready for this? I did, I did the math. I figure I can just keep buying these $5 sunglasses, and even if I buy 12 of them, I only spent $60, and I'll keep spending $5 on glasses till the rapture, which hopefully comes soon enough to where I've not spent maybe half of what it would have cost to buy those expensive sunglasses. Now, please, if you're wearing anything that says Tommy Hill figure or John go figure or you've got some expensive sunglasses don't try to cover them up it's okay God forgives you and uh, <laughs> do you see what I'm trying to say here there's a difference between the price and the value I've heard it said the bitterness of poor quality lingers on long after the sweetness of a cheap price in other words, we, like the Israelites wanting the promised land too easily, cheapen both the quality and the victory of our Christianity by wanting it too easily. Then, when, not if, when the spiritual battles in the Christian life trample us down, burn us out, choke us up, of course we're going to be disenchanted. Of course we're going to become disillusioned. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, chapter 15 in his first epistle, verses 1 and 2. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. What? Listen. Notice Paul says you are saved if you hold firmly. Take a firm hold to the word of the word preached to you. Otherwise, you will have fancied yourself to be a Christian, but it's in vain. You're not. This implies that it's a battle to hold firmly to the word you, you heard preached. This means that there's a propensity for it to 
not take a firm hold. The seed of God's word is not met with that supple soil of your heart. And if the seed of God's word falls on soil that's hard and dry and full of thorns and thistles, then even if it somehow manages to take hold initially, it won't last eventually. It won't take hold. It will only last if the plow of preparation breaks the soil of the hardened heart and rids the mind of the thorns and thistles of its stubbornness and obstinance. When the ground is plowed by counting the cost, picking up the cross, and dying to self, when the seed goes down and dies, then and only then is it ready for the new life in the seed of God's word. When the ground is broken by the cold, hard, rude truth, the bad news of its fallow and shallow condition, then the seed of the good news can germinate and sprout and bear fruit. You know, one of the things I'm, I don't know if it's an age thing, maybe some of you older like me can bear witness with this, but I'm just getting at the place in my life now where uh, I, I, don't, I don't really, I'm not really interested in the surfacey. I don't know, I don't know, I really have time for it. I don't really have any interest in it. I, I am really interested in depth. You know, there, there comes a point, I think, in our Christian experience where our roots need to be down deep enough into the soil of God's word so that when, not if, the storms of life hit, my, the tree of my Christianity doesn't come tumbling down. Why? Because the roots beneath the surface are deep enough and strong enough. I won't fall away. They'll take hold. I don't know, I think sometimes we, we almost celebrate the shallow, the fallow, and I think of Hosea, the prophet, in chapter 10, verse 12, where he writes, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. A.W. Tozer Probably, well, not probably, he did. He said it better than anyone could. In Paths to Power, he wrote the following. Listen. The fallow field, shallow field, is smug, contented, protected from the shock of the plow and the agitation of the till. But... It is paying a terrible price for its tranquility. Never does it see the miracle of growth. Never does it feel the motions of mounting life, nor see the wonders of bursting seed, nor the beauty of ripening grain. Fruit it can never know because it is afraid of the plow. It is afraid of the till. In direct opposite to this, the cultivated field has yielded itself to the adventure of living. The protecting fence has opened to admit the plow, and the plow has come as plows always come, practical, cruel, businesslike, and in a hurry. Peace has been shattered by the shouting of the farmer and the rattle of the machinery. The field has felt the travail of change. It has been upset, turned over, bruised, broken, but its rewards come hard upon its labors. The seed shoots up into the daylight. It's a miracle of life, curious, exploring the new world above it. 
all over the field. The hand of God is at work in the age old and ever renewed service of creation. New things are born to grow and mature and consummate the grand prophecy latent in the seed when it entered the ground. Nature's wonders follow the plow. Can I ask you here this morning, what have you got to lose? Maybe a better way to ask it is, what have you heretofore lost by not permitting the plow to break you, to break that soil so there can be depth, so there can be sprouting and germinating and shooting up of new life? Are you satisfied with your life? I mean, let's be honest. How many of us are stuck in a Christian rut? Our lives are lived in the Christian ghetto. We get up in the morning. We go to work. We come home at night. We go to bed. We get up in the morning. We go to work. We come home at night. We go to bed. We get up in the morning. It's Sunday. We go to church. And then we go home, and we go to bed, especially if the pastor preaches a long sermon. Are you okay with that? The Christian life is not a boring life. Sometimes you'll hang on for dear life, but I promise you, you'll have the time of your life. This is why Paul says what he says here in our text. So we are going, oh yeah, we're in Romans. Where's the, where, oh, is this your introduction? Yeah. Yes, actually it still is my introduction, but you'll be happy to know that it's also my closing as I try to bring it in for a landing. Oh, how I wish we could hear the apostle's tone of voice when he writes this. There's an anguishing. I mean, if somehow we were allowed to hear this audibly, what we would hear is this bitter anguish, this, this lamenting, this screaming out. It's painful, really. I can almost hear Paul just, why, why, Lord, why do I keep doing what I hate to do? I want to do what I want to do, but I can't do what I want to do. I keep doing what I hate to do. Why? Why is it such a struggle? Why is it such a battle? Why is it so hard? The simple yet blunt and rude answer is that the closer to Christ we are, the harder the battle will be. And take heart. It won't let up. It won't let up until we're caught up. We're stuck in this flesh. We're always going to battle the flesh. We're stuck in this world, not of it, in it. We're always going to battle the big three, as I like to call them. The devil, the world, and the flesh. Until that day, it will only get worse. Now, I'm keenly aware that some of you are finding this very depressing, very discouraging, but here's the thing. Both you and I signed up for this. I didn't sign up for this. Yeah, you did. We all signed up for this. Well, when did I sign up for this? You signed up for this when you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You signed up for the struggle. And in so doing, you agreed to the terms and the terms were disclosed and what the total cost would be, what it would cost you to follow Christ. Well, I don't remember agreeing to the terms. Oh, no, you did. You clicked the agree button, but you didn't read the terms. <laughs> yeah, see, I know. I do that, too. <laughs> I mean, have you, have you seen how lengthy those things are? I mean, it's like, you know, at the bottom they have the link, you know, page one, page 39, 
page, and, you know, I'm like, I'm going to read that. No, agree, click, install the thing already. Come on. <laughs> Let's get this show on the road. Well, in the terms that we agree to, there's this little detail. <laughs> it's called picking up the cross, dying to self. The risk of sounding morbid, in effect, we're agreeing to and putting our signature on our own death certificate to our whole life. And absent this picking up of our cross and dying to ourself, we have no hope of ever tasting from the delicious cup of a victorious Christian life. I mean, how do you have the victory absent the battle? If the Christian life isn't a battle, then the Christian life surely cannot be <laughs> a victory. In order for there to be the victory, there has to be a battle, right? The more bitter the battle, the sweeter the victory. And thus, the victory I'm the recipient of will be proportionate to the battle that I'm engaged in. Enter Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 19. This formally concludes the introduction to our sermon today. <laughs> and also the introduction to our closing of our sermon today. It's the first one and the only one that we'll look at today, and it's found in verses 15 through 19. Here it is. When the going gets tough, I'm enabled to fight the battle. Now in verses 15 and 16, it almost seems like Paul's talking in circles. He says, I don't understand what I do because I don't do what I want to do, but I do what I hate to do. And if I do what I hate to do and don't want to do, <laughs> I agree that the law is good. Hold on to that for a second. He explains in verse 17 that as it is, it is no longer I myself who does what I don't want to do and that which I hate to do because it's actually sin living in me. Then in verses 18 and 19, he says, it's not that I don't want to, it's that I can't. Why? Because nothing good lives in me. What I keep doing isn't the good I want, but the evil I don't. What's he saying? Why is this so? Paul's brutal battle begs the question, of why is it like that? Why is the Christian life such a struggle? Why is it that I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things that I do want to do? Because I am unable to do the good I want because, simple answer, sinful nature. There's nothing good in me. I am rotten through and through. Well, that might seem like a firm grasp of the obvious. I, you know, Pastor, you've already, for weeks you've been screaming at us, tell, telling us how stinking of a sinner we are. So I already know I'm a sinner, but surely there must be something good. No, there's not. Oh, but I have a good heart. No, you don't. <laughs> Ask Jeremiah, your heart is deceitfully wicked. You can't even know it. It's beyond hope. See, when I come to that place where I realize that I'm rotten through and through, there's nothing good in me, then that means that the law is good and I'm not. See, if I think I'm good and the law's not, then that's going to keep me trying. And herein lies the battle. See, I, I'll still want to, but I won't have the how to do the want to. You know, this is the thing that keeps us paying for these how-to books and how-to sermons. I think somebody should write a book, not how to, but who to. No, I, it's not, you know, a play on words, but what does Paul say? Who will deliver me from this body of death, O oh, wretched man that I am? He doesn't say what. What book do I need to buy because I'm a wretched man and be, I need to be delivered from this body? It's not what. It's who. It's to who. It's who to. It's not how to. 
But the problem is I keep trying to. I keep fighting in my flesh. Why? Because I still think there's something good in me, that I'm a good person. And as long as I'm holding on to that and dismissing that, I am rotten through and through. Nothing in me is good that is in my sinful nature, then I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep on fighting. And I am destined for failure in the Christian life. Is that you here this morning? Has your Christian life been riddled with defeat? Have those battles always been met only with failure and frustration? Could that be why? You still think you can, that you're good? You still think because you want to do good that you can do good? That's not what our text says this morning. You cannot. You cannot. And as soon as you accept that, in fact, the sooner you accept that, the sooner you give permission to the Lord to do that instead of you and for you. And I promise you, what awaits you is victory at the end of that battle. Why don't you all stand? Father in heaven, we're admittedly coming to the close of a really gnarly passage of scripture that arguably is difficult for even the mature believer to really fully grasp and understand. So as we asked you at the beginning, we'll also ask you at the end, will you now take this and minister it to us? that it might become real in our lives. Lord, we have the want. We know the how. But we need you, the who. Will you? We ask you.